final plenary talk of the conference. Uh, to, our speaker today is Stanley Warnow. Stanley Warnow is the founder professor of engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she has a dual appointment between computer science and bioengineering. Uh, she received her PhD in mathematics at UC Berkeley, and she did postdoctoral training at uh, the University of Southern California. She is the recipient of many awards, such as uh, the National uh, NSF Young Investigator Award, David and Lucille Packard Foundation Award, uh, and Emmeline Bigelow Conlad Fellowship, um, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and most recently she was elected as an ACM Fellow in 2016. Uh, as you will see, her research combines um, mathematics, computer science, and statistics to develop um, models and algorithms for reconstructing complex and large-scale evolutionary histories for both biology and uh, computational linguistics. And today she's going to talk about her work on uh, the mathematics of estimating the tree of life. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've been in San Diego many, many times, um, including when I had the Cypress Project. We used to come here a lot. This is probably the most beautiful day that I've ever seen here. It's great. OK, so I work on evolution. And, and everyone probably knows what evolutionary trees are like. But this is a species tree, showing that human and chimp are more closely related than they are to gorilla, orangutan, etc. Um, there's, there's these two famous sayings, the first of which is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, which was a very influential saying by Jabjansky that people talk about all the time, not just in evolution. And then there's the other statement, which is that nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of phylogeny. So phylogeny are these graphical models of evolution. Now, yes, evolution tells us about the function of genes. It tells us about systems biology. It tells us about populations and how they've moved across the globe. But what is really interesting to me are the computational challenges. It's a very rich area. And within the area of computational biology, I think it's probably the most mathematically well-formed. So there's very beautiful, clean, and difficult open problems in mathematics that you can address. And so this is why it's fun for me. It ranges from graph theory to probabilistic analysis of algorithms to combinatorial optimization to the development of effective heuristics for NP-hard problems, all sorts of stuff. So what I'm going to be telling you about today are some very nice problems that we're recently working on. In fact, that my uh, former graduate student who's sitting in the front row right there uh, is responsible for many of these results. OK, so here is the simplified model of evolution that many of you will, may have seen. You have a DNA sequence that is, that is a string over ACTG, a DNA sequence at the root of a phylogeny. And it's evolving down the tree with substitutions. So the string is not changing in length as it evolves down the tree, but it's evolving and you get sequences at every node. So if you go back to the uh, picture of a species tree, imagine you're just looking at a piece of the genome within each of the species and looking at how it's changed over time. So under this simplified mathematical model where the sequences do not change in length, and the only thing that happens is that there are substitutions. You can talk about the ability to infer the evolutionary history from the sequences you see at the leaves, only at the leaves. So to do that, you make a mathematical model. And this model that you might look at, they range from the simplified models, such as Juke's Canner, which is described here, to more complex models. But in essence, what they say are all the positions in the sequence evolve identically and independently down the tree. And then there's a substitution matrix that tells you if you change, what, how you're going to change between the different nucleotides. And then you just write down a probability of change on every edge. So it's a very simple model. And the Juke Scanner model says if you change, you change with equal probability to the other nucleotides. And under this model, knowing nothing but that it is some Juke Scanner model tree, an unknown Juke Scanner model tree, you look at the DNA sequences and you say, can you infer the tree? Now, obviously, if you have very, very short sequences, your chances are very, very bad. So for example, if you have a single nucleotide, you can't do much. But as the length of the sequence increases, that means the amount of data you have increases, the chance of being able to recover it can increase. And if you design your method well, you can actually prove mathematically that your method will reconstruct the tree with probability converging to 1. 
So there's only a finite number of trees on any n number of leaves. And so you, there's a, there is a real distinct probability that you can do it. And if you do it correctly with good algorithm design, you can do it. OK. So statistical consistency is this idea that as the amount of data increases, that your error should go to zero. It doesn't have to go to zero monotonically, but it should go to zero. This, to prove this, you need a mathematical model of evolution, and then you have to prove that your method has these properties. So it's not something you can establish in a simulation. So this is the nature of most work in phylogeny, is you have a model of evolution, you design an algorithm, and you prove it's statistically consistent. That's most of the work is in that way. So the questions, is the model tree identifiable? Which is to say, is it, can you actually write down the tree, topology, let's say, and perhaps the numerical parameters from the probability distribution on the site patterns? Um, then which methods are statistically consistent? How much data does your method need to reconstruct the tree with high probability? Of course, that will depend upon the model tree and, and the probability that you want. And then, of course, the computational complexity. So it's a combination of probability theory and computer science. So we know a lot about these problems. So again, this is just DNA sequences evolving down a tree. The same thing for uh, amino acid sequences evolving down a tree. We know a lot. We know which models you do get identifiability, which methods are statistically consistent. We know a fair bit about how much data methods need. There's a lot of beautiful results in this area that you could look at. Sebastian Rock, for example, has proven many beautiful uh, theorems at University of uh, Wisconsin Math. And just about everything is NP-hard. So you need, you need very good heuristics, because you can't analyze data sets that are of any size. So here we are in a world where we have statistically consistent methods. As the amount of data increases, the error will go to zero. We also have genome scale data. That encourages us to think that with genome scale data, we might be able to get the tree of life, right? And then answer all the biological questions that people want to answer using phylogenies. So that's the idea. Genome scale data, you can do phylogenies, right? Lots of data, and lots of data makes life simple, right? Isn't that what we've all been told? Big data makes life simple, you can do everything. Um, the problem is that as you go across the genomes, the trees change. Different parts of the genome have different histories. If you are going to try to use this idea of statistical consistency, you don't want that to happen. You want them to all evolve down the same tree, and then you just have more data from the same tree. That's not what's going on anymore. What's going on now is this different parts of the genome have different histories. There are multiple causes for this heterogeneity. Uh, one of them is just gene duplication and loss. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, another one is horizontal gene transfer. I'm also not going to talk about that. Um, the, probably the dominant one is incomplete lineage sorting, which is the topic of today's talk. Incomplete lineage sorting is a population level process that creates this heterogeneity. And what's really interesting about incomplete lineage sorting is that you simply expect it to happen with probability to going to one as your data increases. You will see heterogeneity in your genome data if you have enough of the genome data, you don't filter it. So what is incomplete lineage sorting, and how does it affect us? I'll get to that in a bit. But I'm just going to tell you that on two projects that I was on last, in the last few years, it caused tremendous problems for us. So the avian phylogenomics project was one. Uh, it was a, essentially a four-year project that started with the first year of, of Siavash's graduate program and ended when he graduated. So it's really because of him. Um, this is Siavash right there. OK, so this was a large project with more than 100 uh, authors. And we had 50 bird species, essentially, with whole genomes, 14,000 different regions of the genome that we looked at. And the heterogeneity was absolutely huge. And there, almost every tree was different from every other tree. So that was one problem. Um, a plant phylogeny. Another problem, a somewhat larger number of species, a smaller number of genes, again, massive heterogeneity. In both cases, the heterogeneity was consistent with incomplete lineage sorting, which means we had a situation where we wanted to get a phylogeny and answer problems about biology, and we couldn't do it 
because of the heterogeneity, we had to use specialized methods to be able to answer it. And the specialized methods that were available at the time were not adequate. So in fact, this talk is really to tell you what has been happening in developing new methods that can give better accuracy. And how by developing these new methods, which have good theoretical performance and good empirical performance, we're able to close the gap on being able to answer questions about the evolution in the tree of life. OK, so incomplete lineage sorting. It confounds phylogenetic reconstruction for many different groups of organisms. And there's a huge debate in the literature about how to construct phylogenies in the presence of this kind of heterogeneity. Probably not too many of you are aware of this uh, debate, but it's pretty uh, intense right now. Um, in both you know, the major press and the minor press. Uh, and the, where the debate is centering is on what are the theoretical guarantees? Are they actually applicable to biological data or not? And also, what about empirical performance? What do we actually understand about the methods based upon performance on data? So this is the con contrasting uh, perspectives that are being brought. So this talk, the model of the multi-species coalescent model and what incomplete linear sorting is, and then statistically consistent estimation under the model, and the impact of gene tree estimation error on the estimation of species trees and on the theoretical guarantees. And then two methods, one is called astral and the other one is called statistical binning. And finally, if there's time, I'll talk about some open questions. So the multi-species coalescent model. What you want to think of here, here are th four different individuals, okay? And these four different individuals, and we are just picking one individual in each case. The dots represent individuals. Each line is, is a, uh, a generation. So as you go up, you're changing generations. And what you're tracing is where each of these individuals got a particular allele for a particular gene. So you pick the parent they got it from, and then the, which parent of that parent they got it from, and you just keep going up. So what's going up here is that this stuff is a gene tree. So we're tracing the evolution of a region within the genome. It's inside a species tree. Okay, so the broad outline is a species tree. This other stuff is a gene tree inside it. And what you can see is that these two lineages have a common ancestor here which is in the first part of the species tree where they could have a common ancestor. So if you look at the, the gene tree, the human and chimp are siblings inside the gene tree as well as in the species tree. However, if you look here at a gorilla and orangutan, um, they're siblings in the gene tree because the, the first time that they coalesce is up here and so the, in the gene tree, they're siblings, but they're not siblings in the species tree. What's going on is that these two lineages, which could have coalesced in this region, did not. So they all come up here, and now you have three lineages, and any pair of them can coalesce first. And just by chance, which is, in this case, one out of three, the wrong pair coalesces, OK? Um, so what is the model? If the population size is big, the chance of coalescing reduces if the number of generations is sh small, the chance of coalescing reduces. So short times between speciation events and large populations increase the probability of incongruence, of, of heterogeneity. So when you have a rapid radiation, you will have a lot of this heterogeneity. But even without a rapid radiation, you will have some if you have enough gene trees. So that's the model. So how do we estimate phylogenies from multi-locus data, from multiple genes. There's two major competing approaches. There are others as well that I'll talk about later. But the two major approaches, the first one is called concatenation. And what it amounts to is pretend that there's no problem. So you simply put all the data together and treat it like it's going down the same tree. And then you estimate under that model. Okay? You ignore the possibility of heterogeneity. Okay, that's the first one. Concatenation, put everything into one big matrix and analyze it. The second major approach is don't ignore it. Construct a tree on each of the different regions. Okay, so you want to get gene trees. And now you have these gene trees which don't have to agree. And then if you use that, those gene trees well, you can actually reconstruct a species tree. 
Those are the two major approaches, concatenation and what we will call summary methods. So the traditional approach of concatenation is still what is being used everywhere. If you look at, in fact, any phylogeny that's published, with probability that's very close to one, you will find only one tree, and it will be a concatenation tree. If you look at recent studies, you will find concatenation trees and coalescent-based analyses. But concatenation is almost always the dominant approach. So what do we know about this? We know theoretically it is not statistically consistent. That means in the presence of sufficient heterogeneity from ILS, you can actually reconstruct the wrong tree. This is a bad thing, okay? So you don't want to have a method that's not statistically consistent. I just want to point out that the, the theorem by Sebastian Roch and Mike Steele is that an unpartitioned maximum likelihood analysis is inconsistent. And what that means is if you really treat all of the sites as evolving down exactly one model tree, so nothing has changed between the different genes, they're all evolving down the same model tree with one set of numeric parameters, then you have a statistically inconsistent method. Okay, what about performance on data? It's really interesting. It's not obviously bad. There are lots of conditions where concatenation is better than all of the existing summary methods, and we do not know why. So there are conditions where you do have gene tree heterogeneity where concatenation is quite reliable. Um, not theoretically yet, because we don't have theorems to explain it, but in terms of performance on data. On the other hand, if you have enough of this heterogeneity, then concatenation is really not a good idea so the simulations show it's not uniformly a bad idea. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. It really seems to depend upon how much heterogeneity is present. Okay, what about summary methods? So now you have the input as a set of gene trees and you wanna use those gene trees and get a species tree. How should you do it? So imagine you have, you know, in this case, uh, eight taxa, eight species, and you have all these gene trees on these eight species, and you just look at all the gene trees, and maybe you just pick the gene tree that appears the most often, right? That's an obvious thing to do. So pick the most frequent gene tree. The problem is it's a bad idea. It's also not statistically consistent. You can have model conditions where the most common gene tree is not the species tree, okay? The most probable gene tree is not the species tree. So what should you do? You should not pick the most frequent gene tree. Standard consensus methods don't work. Standard supertree methods don't work. And by don't work, I mean theoretically they are not statistically consistent. So what can you do? So here's this really nice theorem. And I'm going to tell you the theorem. You have an input set of rooted gene trees. And you look at any three species, A, B, C. And then you look at just the induced gene trees on A, B, and C. Now, the most frequent gene tree on ABC will converge to the species tree on ABC as the number of genes increases. So the most probable rooted three taxon tree is, is the same as the species tree. What does that tell you? If you have a collection of gene trees, what would be a statistically consistent method? Look at all the three taxon subsets. For every three taxon subset, look at the most frequent gene tree on those three taxa, like the induced gene trees, write them down. Then there's this really nice uh, algorithm by Eho, Sagiv, Simansi, and Alman, which comes out of databases, that says you can, given a set of rooted three-leaf trees, you can determine compatibility and construct the tree with which they're compatible in polynomial time. A nice recursive algorithm. Okay, so that means we have an algorithm, right? We're done. We have a way of constructing species trees from rooted gene trees. Methods that are based upon rooted gene trees and will construct species trees from rooted gene trees are taking advantage of this statement about rooted three-leaf trees. I just want to point out that when you go to four, it no longer works. Rooted four-leaf trees, you no longer have the property that the most probable rooted four-leaf tree is identical to the species tree. It's something called the anomaly zone. So three is okay for rooted trees, four is not okay for rooted trees. But we give it, it gives us an algorithm. Okay, so back to the thousand plant transcriptome project. We wanted to construct a species tree. We had massive gene tree heterogeneity. At the time that we had this, 
The leading method for constructing species trees was, was called MPS. MPS works with rooted gene trees, and it's based upon the same idea that the dominant rooted triplet tree is the species tree. It's statistically consistent. Uh, it's not polynomial time because it's a heuristic, but nevertheless, we couldn't use it. The reason we couldn't use it is that to root gene trees, you need some special properties, and fundamentally, we needed outgroups. And we had so much missing data that we couldn't always find outgroups. Outgroups are species that are clearly more distantly related, so you can root the tree by picking them up at the outgroup. So the statistical models of evolution are time reversible. They don't give you rooted trees. To root the gene trees, you need outgroups. So we had so much missing data that we didn't we weren't able to use most of our gene trees. So we couldn't use MPS. MPS also is not fast enough to run on the data set size. So we had a problem. We saw lots of gene tree heterogeneity. We saw rapid radiation. We weren't comfortable with the analysis based just on concatenation because of this. So we needed to have something that works with unrooted gene trees. So here's another theorem. And this one says it's like the three tax on rooted trees, but it's about four tax on unrooted trees. Same problem, but now you have unrooted gene trees. You look at four leaves at a time. The most probable four leaf tree is topologically identical to the species tree. And that's true for every four leaf subset. For every model tree, doesn't matter. It's always the case. It's not true for five, but it's true for four, okay? so. Now we have an algorithm again. We look at all of the gene trees. We look at the four leaf subsets. We look at the frequency of the three possible trees on four leaves. We write down the most frequent one we see for every four leaves. And now we have four leaf subtrees. You can get a tree from four leaf subtrees. How do you do it? Imagine you have a quartet tree on every four leaves. You look at the quartet trees and you say, which pair of species could be siblings? You do that based upon never being separated in any quartet tree in which they're together. Now you find a sibling pair, you throw one out, you recurse, you get a tree back, and you stick it back in. So that is a way to get a tree given all the quartet trees. Polynomial time, statistically consistent. Okay, there are methods that are based upon this idea that quartet trees define the species tree, that the most probable quartet tree is topologically equal to the species tree. The first one that was developed is the population tree from Bucky, which was developed by Cecile N.A. and others and Brett Largett at the University of Wisconsin. That method has a Bayesian way of computing quartet trees, and it's very nice, but it's very computationally intensive. So we couldn't use that kind of method. It just doesn't run on big data sets. So we developed a new method, which is called ASTRAL. Um, I don't remember what ASTRAL stands for. Accurate species tree, okay, I can't remember. Um, it's very simple. Um, here's the idea. Here's the optimization problem. The input is a set of gene trees, t, little t1 up to little tk, and they're unrooted, okay? And they're all the same leaf set. And what we want to do is find a tree on the full set of taxa that minimizes the quartet distance to those input trees. So the quartet distance is just the number of quartet trees on which they disagree. So you're basically finding a median tree in this entire set. Okay, just minimizing the sum of the quartet distances. The amazing thing about this problem is that if you solve it exactly, you have a statistically consistent method for estimating the species tree from gene trees. It's of unknown computational complexity. So if someone can prove it NP-hard or solve it in polynomial time, that'd be great. What we did is solve a constrained version of the problem. So what we did is, let's, instead of trying to solve it exactly with a heuristic, we said, let us find a set of bipartitions on the set of species, and then constrain the species tree to have to draw its bipartitions from that set. So Astral is an exact algorithm which uses dynamic programming and runs in polynomial time to solve this constrained version of the problem. So the input is going to be a set, capital X, of bipartitions and the gene trees. And it will solve the problem exactly in time that is quadratic in X and then linear in the number of, the product of the number of, of genes and taxa. It's statistically consistent if you make X contain all of the bipartitions from the input gene trees. And in that case, it's a polynomial time algorithm and just the input. 
It's open source software and is now being used a lot. Um, so simulation study, I'm going to show you how well it works. This is a very complex simulation with ranging the amount of gene tree heterogeneity, the number of genes, the number of species, where the speciation events are taking place, and we're going to look at the error with respect to the number, the percentage of the branches of the true tree that you fail to recover. So that's an error rate that we're going to be reporting. Uh, by the way, this is on my webpage. The talk is on my webpage, and you can download it if you want. Okay, first thing is tree error. When we vary the number of species, but we always have a thousand genes. So this error is ranging from down here is about 2%, and the largest we're seeing is about 13% of the tree is wrong. That's where the error is ranging. How much of the tree that you get is wrong. The, at 10 species, both astral and the leading alternate method, MPS, have the same error, about 2%. But as you increase the number of species, you can see that MPS error just jumps, okay? Astral's error increases, but much more gradually. And at 1,000 species, it still has pretty low error. So we've improved upon the topological accuracy by moving from rooted trees to unrooted trees and by having this, this really nice, clean combinatorial optimization instead of having something that's a statistical heuristic search. OK, NJS is another method that is sort of in between in terms of performance. Um, it basically is a neighbor joining tree on a distance matrix that you can compute. It has surprisingly good accuracy. We didn't develop NJS, and I'm still surprised at how, how well it performs. Running time is another thing. The running time of astral, NJS, and MPS is a function of the number of species. MPS cannot run on more than about, um, is that 100? 100 species in 24 hours. Um, NJS can run up to 500, but we can do 1,000. So there's, we can actually scale to very large data sets. This is sequential running time. This is not parallelized. OK, so back to the 1,000 plant transcriptome project. We presented two trees in our PNAS paper. One was a concatenation analysis. One was this astral analysis. And what was very nice is that they were very similar. So it was a very satisfying thing to have a standard traditional method of analysis, concatenation, maximum likelihood analysis on a concatenated alignment, and have this new just graph theoretic analysis based on quartet trees give very, very consistent results. OK. On biological data, this is an interesting thing. You can take, uh, this is a story about um, Amborella. Um, was, this is a plant phylogeny. And the debate was, where does this particular species belong? And what happened is, um, in 2014, there was a study that said, concatenation puts it in one place. We did a coalescent analysis using MPS and put it in another place. And we're right, because we did a coalescent analysis. We did an astral analysis on the same data set and got the same result that concatenation got. So what this is saying is that the concatenation analysis agreed with us, and it just didn't agree with the other coalescent analysis. I do not know which one is correct. But it's not just a question of coalescent versus concatenation. So the method choice is also as important as the model. Okay. Now, the other project, the avian project, the avian project was published after the, the plant project, but we did the analysis before. So what this means is that when we had to deal with the data, that, and we did not have astral. So what we had was MPS. So we had these uh, 14,000 different gene trees, and every single one of them was different from the species tree we got using concatenation. We were not happy with the situation. Then we ran MPS because we thought there's a lot of gene tree heterogeneity, there's incomplete lineage sorting, it's a rapid radiation. MPS, MPS gave us a tree that was completely different, well, not completely, but very different from the tree that we had gotten with concatenation and different from prior analyses. So we had this really difficult question. We have a data set where we're sure there's gene tree heterogeneity, it looks consistent with ILS. And the coalescent analysis gave us one tree. The concatenation analysis gave us another tree. Which one are we going to go with? If we go with the concatenation analysis, we can't really justify it on the basis of theory. If we go with the coalescent analysis, it's violating previous studies. So what do we do? Well, what we did is we did a bunch of simulations, and we discovered that 
under the conditions that we were seeing, which is that we had um, gene trees that had lots of estimation error in them because they had what is called low bootstrap support. So they had insufficient data to get very well resolved gene trees. Under those conditions, MPS doesn't give very good results. So if you think about the definition of statistical consistency, the theorems that we have about coalescent analyses so far say that if you have an unbounded number of true gene trees, then your method will be statistically consistent. It will converge to the correct species tree. But this requires true gene trees, not estimated gene trees. So if you have estimated gene trees instead of true gene trees, you don't have any theory. So we went back and we looked at our data, and the average bootstrap support was 25%. That means very poor statistical support for the gene trees, for nearly all the gene trees. So we didn't have a theoretical reason to support the use of the coalescent method. We had bad gene trees. OK, so if you have bad gene trees, you have bad input. How are you going to deal with this? You need to get better gene trees. How are you going to get better gene trees? It's sort of like you know, chicken and egg. So we came up with something called statistical binning. Statistical binning is a way of getting better gene trees. And when you get better gene trees, you can get better species trees. So the key idea behind statistical binning is that all of these gene trees are evolving within the same species tree. They're not completely disconnected from each other, right? They're independent, but they're within the same species tree. So they're actually informative of each other. So if we have 14,000 different genes, and we know that they're not going to be completely different from each other. How do we use that information? So we published this method in science um, in the special issue along with the other avian papers. And we used this method with MPS to get a coalescent analysis. So I'm going to tell you about this method. The idea behind statistical binning is two things. One is you remember that gene tree estimation is improved as you have sequences, the length of the sequences increasing. This is the statistical consistency argument, that as the amount of data increases, the gene tree error will go down. So suppose you have lots of gene tree, gene sequence data, and they all come from the same gene tree topology, right? If you could put them together, you'd get a better estimate of their common tree topology. So if you could figure out which genes actually have the same topology, you would want to put them together. Now, of course, you don't know if they have the same topology, but you maybe could figure that out. The second thing is that even when they don't have the same topology, if there's not too much heterogeneity, then these concatenation analyses are actually pretty good at estimating a tree that's very close to all of these input gene trees. So it's this combination of concatenation is not that bad, and longer sequences improve gene tree estimation. Okay? So here's the algorithm. The usual pipeline is on top. The usual pipeline is you have sequence data that's not yet aligned which means you have to, there's been insertions and deletions that have changed the sequence length. So first you align them, and then you get gene trees, and then you combine the gene trees using your preferred coalescent method, like MPS. We stop and we do something else here. We take these estimated gene trees. The estimated gene trees become vertices in a graph. We're gonna color the vertices of this graph in a few minutes. Okay, so the vertices of the graph represent the genes. We put an edge between two genes if the ways in which the gene trees are different have strong statistical support. So it's OK if the gene trees look different. But if they look different in ways that are, have high bootstrap support, that means we actually believe they have different histories, and we will not put them in the same collection, in the same bin. So we put vertices are genes. And edges between two genes say you can't put them in the same bin because their differences are not random. So alternatively, you could have a very, very, very short edge in a gene tree. And it's just so hard to reconstruct that edge that you just get a random binary tree refining around that. And you want to be able to recognize that random error, that it's just random error as opposed to real error. OK, so now we've got our graph. And then we vertex color the graph so that all the vertices of a given color form an independent set, the usual vertex coloring. Uh, minimizing the number of colors and subject to that, trying to have balanced sizes within the color classes. Oh, OK, balanced minimum vertex coloring. It's an NP-hard problem. 
And so what Siavash did is he modified the Braylaws heuristic. So it's a greedy algorithm that actually tries to keep the, the color classes about the same size. So now we have these colors, and we put all the vertices of the same color into a set. And now every two vertices in the same set represent genes that have maybe different tree topologies, but not ways in which they're statistically significantly different. So then we can do a concatenation analysis on those bins. The concatenation analysis on the bins gives us new gene trees. So instead of having a single gene tree for every gene, we now have a single gene tree for every bin. So we have a purple gene tree, a blue gene tree, and so forth. And then we take these and we give them to the coalescent analysis. And that's how we get the species tree. Okay? So we've re-estimated the gene trees and used the new gene trees for the species tree calculation. So uh, one point is that when we do the concatenation analysis, we're doing something called fully partitioned maximum likelihood. So that means that we have, let's say, three genes in a bin. We are going to assume they have the same tree topology, but not the same numeric parameters. We're allowing the numeric parameters to be different between the different genes. OK, how does it perform? This is how it performs on simulated data. Again, this is tree error. Uh, we have red is the unbinned version of the method. Blue is the binned version of the method. So binning means that you compute these super gene trees instead of the original gene trees. We have five different methods here, and what you can see is that every method gets better. Before binning, the errors range from about 7% up to about 18%. After binning, all the errors are down around 4%. So every method is improving through this binning process. So the problem is that this is not a statistically consistent method. So we discovered this after we wrote the science paper. Um, Unweighted statistical binning is not statistically consistent. Uh, it can give you a flat distribution. The proof is in plus one. But there's a really trivial fix. The trivial fix is instead of having one gene tree for every bin, have as many gene trees as you have genes in the bin. Completely fixes the theoretical weakness. And now we have a weighted statistical binning pipeline and the theorem is it's statistically consistent. So what do I mean by statistically consistent here? I mean as the number of sites per gene increases and the number of genes increase, both dimensions increase, then a pipeline that uses binning and then if followed by MPS or some other method that is coalescent method will be statistically consistent. So pipelines where you first do binning and then you do coalescent method, statistically consistent. Both things have to increase. Simulation study under a wide range of model conditions, some biological, some mathematical, and ranging in terms of how much discordance there is. This number says the average distance between true gene trees and true species trees. And that can be very high in the simulation. 84% means on average the gene trees are 84% different from the species tree. I don't think that's necessarily biologically all that realistic. Okay. What we see is that statistical binning, both weighted and unweighted, have essentially the same impact. Weighted is slightly better than unweighted, but they're both very, very good. They improve gene trees, they improve species trees, they improve branch length estimation, and they reduce the incidence of highly supported false positives. Now, there are conditions where it hurts. The conditions where it hurts are when you have a small number of species and very, very, very high heterogeneity. OK, by small number of species, I mean 10 or fewer. When you get to a larger number, it doesn't seem to be an issue. OK, I'm just going to show you the impact on species tree estimation. This is, on the left is MPS, on the right is astral. Uh, in red, you get the unbinned version. What we're varying here is the, number, the sequence length per gene. So 250 nucleotides up to 1,500 nucleotides. As you make the gene sequences longer, the gene tree estimation error goes down. As the gene tree estimation error goes down, the input to the species tree method improves in accuracy, so the species improve. So unbinned analysis with very short genes have high error, but as you make longer genes, the error goes down. Okay? The dashed black is concatenation. The comparison to concatenation is interesting. With very short sequences, concatenation is better than the summary method. As you have longer sequences, 
the summary method is better than concatenation. So it really depends upon the sequence length. Now what about these two curves here? These are the binned versions. Binning starts with a match to concatenation and is then better than concatenation. So binning is really changing the, the gap between concatenation and coalescent methods. So that instead of having really different results and you don't know which one's right, they actually come a lot closer. Okay, so this is MPS and this is Astral. It's improving both, okay? Astral is a good method, but it's also impacted by gene tree estimation error. So binning is improving gene tree estimation. For those people who don't care about species trees, a lot of people care about gene trees. They wanna be able to answer questions about gene evolution, protein function, protein structure. Getting good gene trees is actually more important to them than having species trees. So this is another point is that this co-estimation framework allows you to get better gene trees, not just better species trees. Okay. On the avian data set, this is a comparison of binned versus um, unbinned MPS. Everything that's in red conflicted with prior studies. So this is the unbinned analysis, this is the binned analysis. The actual differences are not important, just notice that there are lots of differences. So if we had gone with the unbinned MPS as our tree, we would have had a lot of explaining to do. Okay. Now, remember I said that statistical consistency said both the number of sites and the number of genes increase, both increase. That's not realistic, right? I mean, gene data is not infinite. That's why we wanted genome data, because we wanted to be able to have longer sequences. They're not infinite. So what about the theoretical question of statistical consistency when what you have is a lot of genes, but they're not perfect? You don't have perfect gene trees. Modeling this by saying the sequence length per gene is bounded by some number L, whatever L is. Do you have statistical consistency for your method when that's the case? So Sebastian Rock and I looked at this question and we, the only place where we could get a positive result was when you have something called the strict molecular clock. The strict molecular clock says that evolution is exactly proportional to time. So the amount of change you observe is really just a function of time and it doesn't depend upon which species you're looking at. This is not true. The strict molecular clock is an invalid assumption. There's very, very few data sets that look anything close to it. But under the strict molecular clock, mathematically, yes, you can get species trees statistically consistently from a single site per gene. A single site per gene, it works. But as soon as you don't have the molecular clock, it all falls apart. So this is an open problem. What happens? And when I say it all falls apart, I mean we don't have proofs that it doesn't, that you can't do it. We simply don't have any positive proofs that you can. So it's a really nice open problem about just what can you do with finite lengths per, sequence, per gene. So future directions. This is where some of these interesting things happen, is we need methods for combining gene trees that are more robust to gene tree estimation error and preferably that we can prove that they're statistically consistent when you have gene tree estimation error that is well modeled or when you have finite sequence length. We really need that. We don't have it. Major, major, major challenge. Um, a really good direction is to actually co-estimate the gene trees and the species trees together in a statistically rigorous way. In a sense, statistical binning is getting at it, but it doesn't get at it really the right way because it's not a joint model. There are methods for doing this joint co-estimation. For example, um, Starbeast. Uh, probably none of you have tried it. It's a Bayesian framework for doing this co-estimation. It's extremely expensive, and it can't be run on more than about 20 species and 50 genes. So improving that would be an advantage. Um, we need actually better theory about gene tree estimation error and its impact. It's interesting to know that no method has been proven to be consistent in the presence of gene tree <coughs> estimation error. And finally, there's a class of methods called single site methods. What they do is they estimate the tree just from the patterns in the alignments. So that each of the columns in the alignment gives you a pattern. They just look at the patterns. They don't look at gene trees. Those are very interesting methods, and they bypassed gene tree estimation. So they don't need gene trees to do the species tree. Those might actually be a real breakthrough for doing this kind of species tree estimation. So with that, I just want to, um, first of all, thank the organizers for inviting me again. And the person who did much of the work here is this guy, Siavash, uh, who's now here at UCSD in the EC department. Um, Bayezid uh, did a bunch of the work related to weighted statistical binning. 
Bastien Bousseau was also involved with us on the statistical binning paper and the weighted statistical binning uh, improvement. And then Sebastian Rock and, and I have been working on a lot of the theoretical advances. Thank you. Um, so it's a really interesting question. How do you look at the support, you know, how do you estimate the reliability of the tree? Um, the standard way that people do it in phylogeny is something called multi-locus bootstrapping. We're, Siavash is developing alternate techniques that give you support estimates on the branches that are, make much more sense and that are more reliable. So I mean, we can tell you about what we're doing, but there are standard statistical techniques and we're developing different ones so that you don't get just a single point estimate, but some support on each of the branches. Just to follow, quick follow up, is there any theory though for the validity of the bootstrap? No, of course not. <laughs> yeah, that's, an, that's another open question, yes. But there is some, some, well, we can, why don't we just tell you about what we're doing afterwards, yeah. Each bin is a collection of genes, right? Uh, no, they're just joint. So the bins are all, there's partitioning, right? So each color class gives you one bin. So you get disjoint ones. We've also looked at the at how you can get more than one coloring, right, as a result of this. And uh, generally the error doesn't change a lot from, from application of the binning process to another. But if you, if you do it more than once, you know, you can actually look at the different trees you get and get a better idea of the tree. One thing that I didn't comment on is that the concatenation analysis for the avian data was 200 CPU years, um, whereas the binning technique was no, nowhere near that. So this is another point for this kind of approach is that it can actually be computationally more feasible. Yeah. If, if I understand your question, we, I think you're saying is we did, the, we did the binning, like the edges, based upon bipartitions. And I think or you might be saying define the edges based upon triplets as opposed to based upon bipartitions. Yeah, like, I mean, just, so for every triple, there are like say, three different topologies. So bin across the different oh. triplets, but only the oh. shape is a little bit. I think you're suggesting something very different. So what we're trying to do is put genes together so we can concatenate their alignments. But there are other ways that you could define the graph. You don't have to define the graph based upon a bootstrap support conflict. You could, you could base it upon, if they were rooted trees, you could base it upon triplet distances. That's what I thought you were getting at. If they're unrooted trees, you could base it upon quartet distances. So, so you know, this is just one version of how to do binning, and it's clearly not the most sophisticated, but it was a fast one. There are other questions? Yeah? So protein function would be, um, I don't think that that would help here because each of these uh, inputs is a, or each of these quote unquote genes would be one protein, right? And then you would have variability of the function between different members of the protein family, right? Okay, so I don't think that that works. On the other hand, um, you could be thinking about position within the chromosome and, and using that. But we didn't we didn't look at that. So there's there again there are other things that you could do. Yeah. There's someone else on that side that had Thank you.